today. Howard, do you want to show? I think you went last last time, so you can have some reply. Okay. Okay, let me um, start off with this case. Um, this, we've seen this before, but it's a nice example of it. So when interpreting a radiograph like this, um, you can't really come up with a reasonable um, guess at the diagnosis without clinical context. And here's a little bit of a hint, which is post anesthesia care unit. And this is a really nice example of acute airway obstruction lung edema. So on this radiograph, there is actually quite a bit of central parahyla lung alveolar consolidation. I don't know why the distribution is that way in this particular person. In the other cases of this that I have, the distribution of the lung edema hasn't been so central or parahyla particularly. And in some of the other cases I have, there are more findings of interstitial edema. In this patient, there are a peribronchial fluid cuff or two, but otherwise central lung consolidation particularly. And here is the really nice description of the anesthesia folks note. And you can see there and the timing of it and the occlusion of the ET tube and what they had to do to relieve the ET tube compression and anesthesiologists are really quite aware of this. And of course, one would expect as in this patient, this to get better. They kept the patient overnight. I'm not quite sure why, maybe just to be cautious. It is interesting that even the next day, there is still some lung water. It's not entirely normal, but much better, which is interesting. And then he went home the next day. So a really nice case of acute airway obstruction related lung edema, sometimes called negative pressure lung edema. Here is a person, again, we've seen this quite a bit, but I'll show you this one because it's a nice example of it as well. So here is a radiograph at time X and here is a radiograph obtained. So here you can see the difference in the timing at two different times. And on this radiograph, you can see the leads malpositioned having been withdrawn. And you can see the extent to which the leads are really coiled up a lot around each other in the pacemaker pocket. So usually this is called the uh, twiddler syndrome. I mean, sometimes it's believed that patients will actually fiddle around with the pacemaker device itself and turn it round and about in some fashion. But in this patient, um, as you'll see from this description when they fix this, that it's likely that in this very capacious pocket that this pacemaker just turned around itself just in everyday life. I guess when you walk around or you lie down, you get up, you sit and whatever, that if the pocket is really very capacious, that this pacemaker device can flip around. So the generator mobile, in fact, flipping around inside the pocket, you can see here that there was immediate medial extension of the pocket that had been performed in June. And even the suture sleeves had come free. So this is just a nice example of a very capacious subcutaneous space and how the the pacemaker had come free and just basically turned around and resulted in that that had to be fixed. And this is the image after it was fixed and more secure again on the left hand side. Yeah, Howard, I remember one patient we had that she was an active swimmer. And so they thought that was what was causing it to continue to twist was just her repeated arm motion rather than just twiddling with it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's interesting how this one coiled up around there in that fashion, all twisted up around itself and then really twisted up here. Interesting. So I won't call this a twiddler syndrome, but certainly um, 
the capacious pocket and moving around thing. Uh, let me see this one. Oh yeah, okay. So this is a patient, this is interesting, that had an LVAD placed, and I'll see in a moment if I'm correct, but some years ago, so this is not soon after the placement of this left ventricular cyst device, but the patient came in ill, and this is a part of the abdomen that was imaged um, on the 11th, and I'll show you a CT from the next day, but what this abdominal CT shows very nicely are findings consistent with an abscess. So here is the drive line of it, and in close proximity to the drive line and just above, findings very consistent with an abscess. We have peripheral enhancement, we have fluid, we had a bit of air, and you can see it's intimately associated, interestingly, with the pericardial membranes, how it goes up a fair distance. The CT done the next day, which is this one, I'll show you the sagittal, was not done with contrast medium, but this shows you very nicely the extent of that fluid collection behind the sternum. So it goes up quite a distance there. So this thought to be a drive line associated infection with abscess in the anterior mediastinum. Here is a brief excerpt of the operative report, as you can see here, with the sub incision, they got into that space, irrigated it, pus was drained, and so on. They opened that space up and, and took out the pus. So 2014 is the LVAD, so this is quite a long time after that he got this infection. Yes, that happens sometimes. And the superior extension of it is, is quite, quite substantive. I think he had something that was draining when he came in, um, not at the level of the sternum, but somewhere below, if I remember correctly, that he did have an area near his skin, somewhere down here, that there was some fluid draining, but I don't see a collection out there though. All right, let me show you. This trauma case, um, this is a pretty, pretty typical, really bad trauma case in addition to the fractures and so on and so forth, there is a lot of abnormality in two locations. First off, one would likely be concerned about mediastinal fluid accumulation, particularly in the right paratracheal mediastinum and perhaps in the left paraaortic mediastinum. There are also two interfaces as well on both sides of the thoracic spine, which are these which are consistent with a lot of paraspinal fluid blood accumulation. So substantial abnormality. I'll show you quickly on these coronal image that he does have fracture with a lot of paraspinal blood. But there's also blood in the right paratracheal mediastinum, the supraazygous mediastinum. You can see some abnormality involving the aorta right there. But what's interesting about this patient is that the biggest injuries that are vascular injuries are actually up here. So look at this relatively big pseudoaneurysm arising from the right brachycephalic artery, the abnormality going up the parotid to there even, right there, and right there. Here's the pseudoaneurysm coming off right brachycephalic artery with surrounding hematoma. So the aorta has a small injury, but the brachycephalic vessels have a big injury. So it's just a case of multiple pathologies. And I think this is one of the most extensive brachycephalic artery 
abnormalities are seen in the context of trauma, I think. So we certainly see that. Did they stent that or what did they do? Pardon? What was the treatment? Was it just to stent it or? They, they, op they operated on this patient. Uh -huh. Fix this to fix that. What about the descending order? Was that just stented or less, just left alone? Just, if I remember correctly, that was just observed. Can you have a look at that one more time? That was just observed. So we have minimal aortic injury, kind of that type one injury, maybe two of them. Perhaps what we have here is mostly a little bit of thrombus adhering to the intimal injury. But no, that was not managed by any kind of intervention. Got it. Okay, Jeff, I'll stop there and let some other folks go on. I've got one or two more I could show, but there you are. Thank you. All right, David or Travis? Can I go ahead because I may have to leave the conference a little early? Of course. There you go. So do people see a split screen? Yes. Okay. This person has... Um, is an older woman who's got a little mitral annulus calcification, has a calcified granuloma down here, but has some faint nodules in the bases, has this kind of messy looking chest radiograph, and it's looked this way for a while. She has a series of CT scans at an outside hospital, which is now actually an inside hospital since we bought this hospital, Northwest, um, here in Seattle. And this CT scan shows hmm. some big nodules like this. Here's the big one but there are lots of smaller ones too, and lots of mosaic attenuation. And um, this lesion was needle biopsied about a year or two years ago. And it was a, uh, it was a, a um, well-behaved carcinoid tumor. And she carries a diagnosis of asthma. And so this is uh, Dipnec, a pretty extensive case with tons of air trapping and biggish small nodules um, or a lot of the dip neck nodules I've seen before are smaller than these but they're presumably all the same thing and they've not done very much over many years so um, they're probably not anything more malignant than dip neck and this is a granuloma there's some reason for a, a granulomous infection and there's a mitral annulus calcification so very extensive presumed air trapping although we never got expiratory imaging to to confirm air trapping, but the mosaic attenuation is very suggestive of there being air trapping. So Dipnec, this case was brought to my attention by Sadakar a few days ago. So D David, she has a fair amount of mucus plugging as well, which I've not seen with Dipnec. Do you think that's yeah, right there? That's yeah, the right. middle lobe, right. lower lobes. Yeah, and I've got some other CT scans I can compare to see whether this was a more acute, you know, or, yeah. or transient sort of thing. related to her right? right. Yeah, I think that else. Yeah. Or, you know, old ladies have lots of reasons to have some yeah. airway problems. I agree. Okay. Or it could be just uh, so called mucostasis behind obstructed bronchial segments, perhaps. Okay. But that is interesting. Now, here's a, a woman who's had a uh, stem cell transplant, and actually, her neutrophils. Neutrophil count has recovered after her transplant. So I, I'm not sure how many days out or months she is, but she developed this uh, basal lesion here. And I don't know that I have, yeah, it's a middle lobe lesion up here. So people were worried about infection. And here it is as a uh, nodular infection in the middle lobe. Um, very nice and dense. And it's got, you know, we were talking last week. I just realized in preparing last week's cases that one of the things that with fungal infections is I don't think you get air bronchograms very often. So this one fits that pattern of not having good air bronchograms and then a hint of some central lucency or necrosis. So mm -hmm. this lesion was investigated bronchoscopically. I think they lavaged it. I don't think they biopsied it. Um, but there is this returned an infection, but it was nocardia. And they haven't given me any species, they just say nocardia species. And so 
there were some path stains on this thing. I don't know whether those were from the lavage or whether there had been a biopsy, but um, that also showed fil filamentous organisms consistent with nocardia. So this is nocardia. And the, you know we don't see much nocardia in our bone marrow transplant population because people are on Bactrim for uh, pneumocystis prophylaxis, and that also suppresses nocardia evidently. So at her stage, having recovered her count, she might have been off of the usual Bactrim prophylaxis that's um, closer into the time of transplant. So nocardia, uh, not speciated, um, in a person who had had a stem cell transplant and had recovered counts. So just because you recovered counts doesn't mean that you didn't get an infection when you were neutropenic a few weeks before. And then when you recover your counts, you may still have that infection or it may continue to progress for a while until your immune system can catch up with it. What were you gonna say? Oh, I was gonna say, David, your point about the air bronchograms. I, I always think even though nocardia is a bacterium, it, always, it seems to image like a fungus. That's right. Fungus wannabe, yeah. but every of uh, the cases I've seen that we've um, collected, I mean, are masses, big cavities, ugly things that look like aspergillus, mucor, right. kind of like that too. And I don't know why that is. And um, the other thing I learned about it is it's not a commensal organism. So when, when your lavage returns it, unless your lab or your scope's contaminated, it's, it's presumably real. Right. Okay. So I think pneumocardia might have been a fungus when I went to medical school. I, some of these higher bacteria got reclassified. And I think I learned, I think I first learned them as bacteria. Nocardia was a bacterium, and then it was classified as a higher bacterium, which is, I think, one that went to Harvard. Okay. All right. So here's a fellow who uh, got short of breath. And this was an early radiograph, again, from the outside. And this person with this patchy low-grade consolidation seems to be worst of all in the right base. And around that time, he had a CT scan. This is that same time. And he's got this uh, ground glass abnormality with very nice uh, crazy paving pattern. Nice sharp definition here, so geographic margination. And... Um, and here's that worst patch down here, but again, it's a very nice crazy paving pattern. Mm. So I was thinking, did this was this guy perhaps doing sandblasting? Or could this be acute silicoproteinosis? That would be very interesting. Uh, things got worse. Here's a radiograph a few days later, or I'm sorry, C CT a few days later. And at this point, you can see that in just a few days, this has become confluent, but it's the world's nicest crazy paving pattern. Mm. So this would have to be some acute, overwhelming inhalation of something. I thought, maybe it's another vaping case. Okay, so any thoughts? Pure fluid. Um, oh, if you so no, no hemoptysis. No hemoptysis. Um, ingestion of a lot of exogenous lipid, acute exogenous lipoid pneumonia. No. No pleural fluid. Rapidly. He's not, a, he's not a sandblaster. He wasn't sandblasting or anything. He's a truck driver, and uh, he's, uh, you know, his, his wife says he's been losing weight for about a year. He's lost twenty pounds in a year, and then he got acutely short of breath. Okay, and this turns out to be. Pneumocystis. Pneumocystis. Wow. Well, and, and this was, the, by the time he was admitted to us, um, the day after he was admitted to us, some results came in from his outside bronch, and they, there was uh, pneumocystis on um, PCR. And then they pursued his blood counts, and he was very lymphopenic. His lymphocyte count was 0.43, and uh, they identified uh, HIV markers. So this is presentation of HIV AIDS. And as a truck driver, you know, a married truck driver, one consideration is there are a lot of prostitutes that hang out at truck stops and stuff like that. And so that would be the first thing I would think of. I don't know whether people have not gone back and quizzed him, at least not documented in the chart what his, what his risk factors were. So at this point, this is all just 
brand new in the last few days. So uh, I remember I remember before that I've talked about how crazy paving is not unique for alveolar prognosis and that another consideration is pneumocystis and pneumocystis can have geographic margination with very, you know, well behaved and very sharp margins and things like that too. So, but I have, was not thinking of that when I first encountered this case. I was just overwhelmed by the possibility of an acute silico prognosis presentation of uh, the the effusions kind of steer you away from pneumocystis as well. Right, that's right. But I think you know if you're hypotensive and you're getting a lot of volume, yeah, like that, you have other reasons to have. Yeah, you know, right. Maybe some of this is um, overhydration, lung edema, or a component of that from fluid administration. Right. So it's both. Wow. Okay, so um, <clears throat> crazy paving. Um, number one, alveolar prognosis. Number two, in my experience, pneumocystis. Wow. I also you even seen it with sarcoid, and uh, and with hemorrhage, as you guys know, and sometimes even with edema. But here we go. All right, those are my All right. those are my key. Wow, thanks, David. Very good, uh, Travis. You ready? Yep. All right, do you see a scout image from a CT? Uh huh. So this is relevant to a discussion we were having last week when there was a case of a paraganglioma showed, shown. And then this is a patient who's 42. He fell off his bike or surfboard or something and ended up with a radiograph. He was asymptomatic and had this CT. And this was all done outside. And you can see there's a right paratracheal mass. And what's interesting about this study and then the subsequent study, I'll just show you the profound difference in enhancement. I think this first one was done as, as an earlier, maybe as a CT pulmonary angiogram, but this was a follow-up study done where you can see when it's more of a portal venous phase, just how vascular this actually is. It's unchanged in size over several months. And when he was referred to us, he had had three outside biopsies. He had had a trans some two transbronchial biopsies plus a CT guided biopsy. And it had all been inconclusive on the outside, you know, uh, just lymphocytes, NOS. You know, this is the one I was describing last week when I asked the question if anybody had ever seen a paraganglioma in the right paratracheal region, because it's very vascular. It's got that kind of look to it. But the thing that first jumped into my mind when I saw this case was whether this could be a case of Castleman's disease, especially since he was, he was um, asymptomatic. Our hematopathologist looked at the outside cores and concluded, he said there's you know, over 95% chance that this is in fact unicentric or hyaline vascular Castleman's disease based on his analysis of the outside cores of just the structure of the, the lymphocytes. So yeah. this is a, you know, now a confirmed case of, of hyaline vascular or unicentric Castleman's disease. And Seth had mentioned this article Again, this is not a paraganglioma, but in the discussion of paragangliomas last week, he had mentioned this article about where these happen. And I had mentioned how I've seen them in the prevascular space. And I think the, art, the diagrams in here nicely show that you often see these in the prevascular space. You may see them along the, the base of the left atrium, which is where that one was last week, but not really anything along the right paratracheal stripe as we see in this case. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And then this one I mentioned to Jeff. I don't think I showed this a couple of weeks ago because I think we ran out of time. This is a this was a, a pedestrian versus car, and he came in to an outside hospital. You know, he, as you can see, is pretty messed up. A lot of contusion, aspiration, and some of this may in fact be pulmonary edema, and I'll show you why here in a moment. So his aortic arch looks fine. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of motion here, and I don't know if this was picked up on this original study or not, but, you know, and, and I don't think I would call this on this study with this much motion. But there's actually two abnormalities of his aorta. One, that he has a traumatic aortic injury at the, the sinuses of Valsalva, so at the aortic root. And he also has, which I'll show you on the follow-up study, he came in with a troponin leak, and they thought maybe it was a contusion, but then they found that he had 
uh, ST elevation in his LAD territories, you can see decreased enhancement in that area. And I'll show you the repeat gated study in which you see first the root injury right here, just below the right coronary cusp. And also he had a traumatic dissection flap extending into his, into his left main and his LAD. And so even at this time he has you can see decreased enhancement and had reduced function. So a lot of this in his lungs is probably alveolar edema as well from his traumatic injury. So I know that we've seen a couple of cases of traumatic aortic injury at the aortic root. I know Seth showed one from when he was at Maryland that was gated. I think this is the first one I've seen in the wild that got transferred in here. The other thing that was interesting, they said at surgery that he actually had a fistula to the right ventricle from this injury. I don't see it on the imaging. Moreover, it must not have been very big because I don't see any signs of, of right ventricular volume overload either, but that was something else that they noted. So traumatic aortic injury at the aortic root with also a traumatic dissection involving the left coronary artery. Have any of you guys ever seen a case of coronary artery dissection in blunt trauma before? as a finding, as a lesion? Yeah, we, we no. have one here that was an LAD dissection. The imaging wasn't great, but uh, yeah, it had an ischemic injury in the LAD territory. And on the CT, there was just poor feeling of the LAD. Wow. And then this, I've got two kind of companion cases. It's been a theme, both done on the outside and referred in, but this is a patient who developed chest pain after undergoing transcatheter aortic valve placement. You can see the valve is seated where it should be. And this is this was a gated study, so it's a little noisy. This is the systolic image. But you can see there's a little contrast outside of the ventricular lumen. And my colleague Brett saw this and thought that there was probably a perforation of the left ventricular lateral wall, as you see here. It looks like a little string of contrast you know as the explanation and of course you when they're putting a wire into the left ventricle they certainly can perforate it so it's a very small fixed area of contrast that's leaking there oh that's an astute observation wow they weren't excited about doing that you know, they he, he you know he was otherwise doing okay and then he became hypotensive they repeated a, a study a few days later and now you can see that this perforation of the left ventricle has increased, as has the amount of fluid in the pericardial space, as you can see here. This was another gated study, but you can see there's active extravasation into the pericardial space here. Now, what's interesting is they actually took him to surgery, opened him up, drained the pericardial, uh, the hemopericardium, and didn't actually find an injury. I don't, I'm not exactly sure, you know, what the issue was, if he was just unstable or not. But I, and I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have the follow up. But there was another study later which showed an even larger, you know, outpouching of contrast. And he's clinically is, has been deteriorating for other reasons as well. So I'm not sure if they're going to go back in or not. But I think this first one is, it's just a really nice example of very subtle contrast in the pericardium. And then that little channel right there. Oh. And then finally, so about his presentation that they made them get the first CT again. What prompted them to was, order? The uh, it was it was chest pain right after the procedure, uh, and they saw a little bit of loculated fluid posteriorly okay. on okay. echo. I see. So I think they had, and then they were still, you know, and then they, he got transferred in, and, and that study was done. Now this was another one that got transferred in. I don't know the full story, except that this patient had undergone a recent cardiac cath outside. And you can see he has a pericardial effusion and it's intermediate attenuation. There's some, you know, some that's in the 20, 30, 40 range. But in this case, you can see that the, the active extravasation is from the apex and that there's this pocket of contrast. And there's this whole mess of coils here too. And I, I don't know the full story, but my understanding is that this was a perforation iatrogenic from just a routine cardiac cath. I don't know if it's when they were doing a left ventriculogram or not. And I think someone tried to 
seal this up with some coils unsuccessfully because he hasn't had his chest cracked. So this one, if we if I do an NPR, you'll see that it's just coming from the LV apex right in here. So, you know, for whatever reason, we've seen a, a couple of these now from different causes recently post-intervention. So, so do you know whether the calf was right or left or both? Well, this one was a left heart calf, and I don't know if they were also doing a right heart calf or not. And I don't, yeah, and I don't know why they would have punctured the apex, but that's apparently what happened. So I, re I remember doing um, pulmonary angiograms using these stiff NIH catheters back in the around 1980 and stuff like that, and those were, of course, you were on then on the right side, and it was very easy to perforate the right ventricular apex with those catheters. So we did some test injections, and we had a, in a couple of cases, you did a test injection of contrast, and you could, you could see the pericardial filling. So it's very easy to perforate at least the right side of the heart. It seems to me the left is a little more challenging. Hmm. So, all right, Jeff. Okay. Well, I will continue along your theme a little bit here. Let's see. Um, so this first case, you guys should see um, those are the localizers here. So um, this is a patient with pulmonary hypertension who just had a cardiac MRI, and this is the MR angiogram, which did not show any uh, chronic thromboembolic disease, but showed this flap here, I'll put it in multiple planes, uh, in the left pulmonary artery. And the only only thing that had happened at some point, patient was referred here for their pulmonary hypertension. Somewhere, somewhere, somebody recently did a um, right heart cath. And our guess is this is probably um, a subacute dissection flap from a right heart cath, because um, I've never seen a spontaneous flap it doesn't look like thrombus it's too it's too thin and it's kind of it's a little thicker than an usual flap making me think it's not acute and the patient didn't have any symptoms but it doesn't look like your typical thrombus here so i think this is an iatrogenic uh, that's not what i meant to do there we go um dissection of a pulmonary artery in a patient with pulmonary hypertension of unknown etiology have you ever come across this i wish seth were on because i bet they see a lot more but i'm mm. I've seen, a, I've, I've read a case report, I think it was out of Harborview actually, there was a traumatic dissection. And I, I've, and I think I've seen one with a, with a pulmonary artery catheter, but I, I don't recall just incidentally finding spontaneous pulmonary artery dissection. So this, sorry, I, I missed that, Jeff. This was a spontaneous pulmonary I think, artery oh, dissection? I think it's from the right heart cath that was done okay. several weeks before the, the cardiac MR, and this is just what it looks like now. There, there was one case in Ma at Malincrod in the early 2000s in a patient with Marfan's who had a huge pulmonary artery and ended up with a spontaneous dissection. Yeah. But I've never seen one myself. You can follow this one down pretty far, but it does not look like thrombus to me. Also, if they're doing a right heart cath, why would they necessarily have a guide wire or something in that portion of the they artery? They measure, they often will do a wedge pressure while they're there. Okay. Yeah. So you think they yeah. Want That's what I okay. think. Um, all right. And while we're on the theme of iatrogenosis imperfecta, um, this was another case that uh, was sent. Um, this patient is a young patient who had an ablation for supraventricular tachycardia um, and developed this complication right here. You can see left atrium and there's this outpouching and that communicates with the left ventricle. So for a supraventricular tachycardia, they would have done a left atrial RF ablation and um, it was referred to us for repair of this, but this is just a fistula, an atrial ventricular fistula as a complication, which is a known complication. The pulmonary veins themselves are okay, no stenosis, but presumably injured in this general vicinity and with the high pressures, it created this fistula. That's the first time I've seen that, but of course you don't see a lot of ablations in, in young people. So, so this would the the injury was to the left atrium, and right. Then, and somehow I guess it's close enough to the mitral. There's the mitral leaflet right there, 
the thermal injury was enough that it, it fistulized with the left ventricle, probably at the, sort of at the endocardial cushion or what was the endocardial cushion. So, oh, wow. yeah, so they're just going to repair that surgically, I think. All right, this is kind of cool. This is a good physics case. So I'm going to show you this radiograph. And what, so what do you guys think of the radiograph? Travis said he had to go. Um, but what do you guys think of this? This is an intubated patient. You can see um, probably had a head injury or something or some, something intracranial given the lungs aren't horrible. But what do you think about the lungs? Um, how would I describe the lungs? Yeah. Um, I would probably just say subsegmental sized opacities in the infrahyalur regions consistent with atelectasis. Yeah. Okay. I agree. That's what we thought yes. too. But I'm going to... So yeah, there's also a smooth, a smooth bulge that seems to come off the descending aorta. Okay, but yeah, okay. Now I'm going to show you the CT that's contemporaneous to this radiograph, and this is what's shocking: is look at the left lower lobe. Yeah. It's densely, densely consolidated. So this patient had aspirated, and there's a cavity on the right, and all this stuff. But what's what's striking is is just how dense the, let me get to the other side here, how dense the left lung consolidation is. And so when we were, we were talking about this case amongst ourselves and what we think has happened here is with, with digital radiography, one of the things that you can happen, you know, you see this if you have pleural effusions that are symmetric and layering, is you get a, a DR optimization artifact where the computer is trying to make this data set look like a chest radiograph and you get um, sort of reprocessing of the images. I mean, that, that left lower lobe is consolidated, yet we're only seeing a little, as David pointed out, a little interface abnormality. And it's hard to see that little cavity hiding in here, but there's the, the basilar stuff, but it's just underwhelming how much density there is back there. So what's, what's the time interval, Jeff? Between um, this happened, uh, this was the next morning, and the CT mm -hmm. was the evening before, and this isn't all just out of lactatic lung. There's clearly, uh, con angry looking consolidated lung in there. This was very unhappy looking. Mm -hmm. But the CT is the next day? Uh, it's previous. It's right before the radiograph. But they're within a few, I think they're within 12 hours of each other. So um, no, no, no. we've seen this with pleural effusion where you have layering effusions and you can't see them because the it, the, the machine equalizes. Be, because there was density on the opacity on the other side as well, it sort of processed it. I because you still see the heart border um, because the um, it's, you can see the fissures intact. So you have aerated lung in front of it. I'll put these up side by side. Yeah, Chris and I were talking about this, and that's kind of how we rationalize this: is this sort of detector, a reprocessing artifact. I mean, some of it may have changed, but you have enough aerated lung in front of it, and this sort of anterior portion of the lower lobe is still aerated. Maybe that's why we see a little bit of descending aorta here. I don't know. Do you think maybe I'm not in left field, but I'm not sure. Uh, can you make a coronal out of that thin cut? So those thin cuts. Yep. Out of this one. That's wrong way. Let's do this. Um, See, I still think you can see some. It's, Descending yeah. uh, aorta because there's a little bit of aerated lung anteriorly. And you get the hint of that bulge too. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've seen cases of left lower lobe collapse that on lateral view are invisible. Uh huh. Because it's so densely, uh, you know, volume lost and it's just tucked up against the paraspinal region, you just, you, you're just not going to see very much at all on lateral view. So the worse the atelectasis is, sometimes the harder it is to find. Right, right. That's what I think is going on here. And just, you know, the, the, the grayscale and the, the contrast settings, because, I mean, in my mind, the software is written to make it look like a chest radiograph. So, I mean, the classic example is you have layering effusions on both sides that are equal. And so, to, right. you know, unilateral fusion, one hemithorax, one lung would look denser than the other. But if they're both the same density, it the centering, with the, whatever your presets are, it try it, it can't distinguish the pleural fusion from, say, chest wall. So it adjusts the grayscale to make it look like a, like you'd expect your lungs to look like. Uh, yeah, there's a few hints here, but not enough to. I, w I was kind of I was surprised by how much consolidation and volume loss was in that left lower lobe. 
So I guess, Jeff, one question is, what's that bronchus that we see that's sort of tracking the lateral edge of the bulge? Right here? Yeah, do you think that's lingular rather than lower lobe bronchus? Because if that's a lower lobe bronchus, it's an argument against right. what you're up There's, It's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I don't know. Just if someone put out there, we, we were talking about. Also, Jeff, do you have the scalp view, the frontal scalp view from the CT scan tonight? Before? I don't have it loaded, but if I recall, it looked like the radiograph. Okay, that would be very interesting because. Yeah, I can pull the scalp view. Yeah. yeah. Well, here, you know what we can do is we can do um, a race sum here. I think we can go up to 50. Let's see how. Let's see. There's the ray sum. Well, I think you're, I think you're, uh, I think this substantiates what you were saying. Yeah, here, I'll put them up side by side. There you go. So there's your bulge, probably right there. But you still, there's your bronchus. Right. Okay. Yeah. You talking? Yeah. All right. And then I have two, two other cases that are related to each other. So not something we see much here in, uh, in Madison, let me start with this one. So this is a 71 year old female who uh, presented with a cough fever and was treated, uh, this was, uh, was treated for a community acquired uh, infectious pneumonia and wasn't getting much better. And you can see there's this, on the radiograph, we have this mass like area of consolidation and small pleural effusion. Uh, I got the lateral view here and you can see this area of consolidation out there and the effusion is very small. And wasn't getting better, uh, so about a week or so later at that time, got a CT scan. It showed some nodules in the lungs, and you can see as we go down, there's more and more of these nodules. And they have these little halos around them. And then we just have this area of consolidation, sort of mass-like with some air, pushing the airways away in the medial basal right lower lobe. But the big blob of consolidation, which was about a week before, sort of went away a little bit. So uh, not responding and having all these abnormalities, this looks like more of a disseminated infection. And, you know, halos, we typically think about aspergillus, but she wasn't immune suppressed. She does have some bronchiectasis, um, some other just inflammatory thing going on. But ultimately, uh, she had been down in uh, the southwest, I believe it was in the Phoenix area, um, snowbirding. And um, ended up getting a bronchoscopy and a lavage, and this ended up being coxy. And I've seen coxy morph from consolidation to cavities. I don't think I've seen it morph from nodules. If I go back to the radiograph, you really can't see any nodules, but they may have been too hard to see. But this is not, I mean, this is more extensive than I'm used to seeing. I usually see a cavity or a nodule, but uh, she was not getting better so because it was being untreated. So once they switched her over to fungal antifungal therapy, she got better. This was an older case, and I came across it as she was just following up for follow up and is now clear of it. But I mean, you guys, David and Howard, uh, you guys see more coxie than I do. Have you seen it with halos or more distinct? I with halos. I don't think I've seen this with coxie before. Yeah. No. But, um, and the other thing is, uh, it seems to have a lower lobe concentration. The, the typical coxie that we see is. Kind of mid lung, right? Mid and lung. This one almost looks as if um, <clears throat> maybe she breathed a whole lot of dust and, um, you know, um, maybe she coughed it up and then she aspirated what she was coughing up or something like that. That's pretty tortuous. Sure. Uh, I mean, but it really seems to be an airways distribution in the lower lobes. I've not not seen it before. Unless lower unless it started like this, which it can present as consolidation and it became hematogenous. Right. Well, I may explain it. So, yeah. all right. And then here's another uh, same same demographic. This patient was a year older, 72 year old female. Let me get these in the right order. So, this was her initial radiograph right here, and she presented with cough and has this very subtle nodule on the left. And then um, let me just show it. The CT is a little earlier, but it's contemporaneous to that um, abnormality. And you can see in the left lower low, we have this thick walled cavity or nodule with a little lucent center in it. So um, of course, 
out here we 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 don't see um coxy so when i see this we typically think neoplasm um, histo rarely cavitates and blasto can present with a cavitary nodule but they're usually a lot uglier than this but she had also been a snowbird um, and was treated for coxy but what's interesting with her is um at follow-up her titers started to go back up so this was uh, at time point presentation this is about uh, four months later and you can see there's the nodule in the radiograph and then six months after that it's getting bigger again. So uh, she didn't respond to the treatment. So she had another CT, which is going to show, uh, of course, this thing getting bigger. So sort of a, there are a percentage of patients with coxie. And I know, David, you've shown some. I think we've seen a few in the webinar where the cavity doesn't go away. Or sometimes they have consolidation that's left with the cavity. You can see there's a little bit of, I don't know if it's sloughed lung or something still inside of it. But it definitely has expanded out. It hasn't calcified or anything like that. But it does correlate with increasing uh, titers uh, against coxy. So <clears throat> this is one of the 10 or 15 percent that didn't clear on its own or with treatment. So they have to, I guess, uh, be a little bit more aggressive with therapy. But um, I've, I haven't seen coxy fail treatment, at least. And I don't, I don't know the whole story. It's possible she didn't finish her therapy or was incompletely treated. But uh, one of the ways that we can follow it besides on imaging is with uh, serum titers for coxy. It's it's special relationship to the interlobar fissures. Really interesting. Too. Yeah, it is. It it goes kind of starts in the lower lobe and crosses into the upper lobe there. So it somehow got across the fissure, which you know we see with. It's interesting. We see that with angioinvasive infections. So this is clearly coxy can be pretty aggressive locally. Whereas, um, but I I see it. I see a few cases every year, and there's two demographics in which I see them. One is the older snowbirds. So they come back in May or June, and we'll, we'll occasionally see some remnants of coxy, uh, a nodule. And then it's the people who go down there and do sort of, uh, there's a mud runners or whatever down there. There's some, there's a lot of, of motocross down in Arizona. We had a guy who had coxy from motocross kicking up all the dirt. And then people go down there and play golf as well. Um, of course, it's endemic all the way up the west now to what, eastern Washington, I know. So that not mm -hmm. just the Arizona, but that's where a lot of people in the Midwest, at least uh, for a long time, would winter would actually be Arizona rather than going down to Florida. That's more uh, west of uh, east of Chicago. You see Florida. So, mm -hmm. but you have to always have a high index of suspicion for coxie in our neck of the woods. Mm. Okay. So those are my cases. I'll get that scout for that other one, but I think the race on is yeah. All right. Very good. Talk to everybody later.